Hello there. What a political move to stick two fingers up at Suella Bradman. Politics at Jack and Sam's is the podcast where we tell you what's going to happen next week in the wild world of Westminster. My name is Jack Blanchard of Politico and with me as always is the great Sam Coates of Sky News. Keeping you ahead of the political agenda. One top civil servant said to me they're 70-30 in favour of thinking something will happen as soon as Monday. Sam, is it going to happen? Yes or no? Listen to Politics at Jack and Sam's wherever you get your podcasts. Diabetes, obesity, heart attacks. Three conditions this country has a problem with. Three illnesses that are clearly linked. And in semaglutide, we have a drug that is effective on all of them. Originally developed to treat diabetes, it quickly became apparent that it was also making patients shed pounds. You may know it better as Ozempic, which has taken the weight loss market and social media completely by storm. But now a study of more than 17,500 adults has indicated it could cut deaths from heart disease by 20%. The research demonstrates that those suffering cardiovascular disease, who could therefore be at risk of heart attack or stroke, have their chances massively reduced by taking this drug, independent of them losing any weight. All of which is why the reporter's authors are suggesting semaglutide could and should be mass prescribed. I'm Neil Patterson. Welcome to the Sky News Daily. Later, we'll get the lowdown on how it all works with one physiologist, but let's begin with our science and medicine correspondent, Thomas Moore. Good to see you, Thomas. Semaglutide, or Zempic, uh, Wigovi, um, whatever you call it, what was this originally designed for? So this was originally being investigated uh, for type 2 diabetes. Now, that's... you. That's one that you tend to develop as you get heavier, as you get older. Uh, And they found that people were shedding an awful lot of weight at the same time. And some bright spark thought, hang on, here's an opportunity. Uh, And so they came up with a slightly different uh, version, Wigovi, which they then started targeting for weight loss. And it does lead to quite significant weight loss. And we now know that from this study of 17,000 patients. So these are big studies Mm. and that gives a lot of statistical power, one not to ignore. But of course, along with the type 2 diabetes treatment, along with the weight loss, this study has found something pretty remarkable. Walk us through the data because, again, we've, 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 we've used the phrase game-changing perhaps too too often, but on the face of this research, it looks like it could be. For sure. Yeah. So this is a, a four-year study. Now, at the moment, the NHS prescribes these drugs uh, to, to people who are living with overweight or obesity, or in some cases, type 2 diabetes, mm-hmm. uh, if they have uh, an underlying uh, health condition, heart disease generally. But what this is showing is that the benefits of this drug go way beyond the two years that the NHS is using it for. This is out to four years. Mm -hmm. People are maintaining that weight loss for a prolonged period. So they are lighter, they're feeling better, they're less likely to go to hospital uh, and less likely to become ill. So these are big results. But the other really big thing that comes from this study is that it's not just about the weight you lose Mm. because irrespective of that, people still had a big drop in their risk of a heart attack and uh, a stroke and uh, heart disease in general. And that's really significant because it could change the way we're using these drugs. Yeah, I mean, looking at some of the kind of statistics, the cost to the economy of heart disease, £25 billion, Mm. 68,000 deaths, 250,000 hospitalizations. If we could do anything to reduce that part of the burden on the health service, like the rest of the health service would be very, very pleased. For sure. Eight million people in the UK are living with heart disease. And, and the doctor who was involved in the study who, who treats patients in his clinic believes half of those could be taking uh, semaglutide injections on a regular basis. And that's almost certainly going to be lifelong, just in the same mm-hmm. way that people are on statins in the long term or blood pressure medication. This is something that we need to completely change um, our view of these drugs. And people do look at them and and it gets caught up in the prejudice that an awful lot of people do have um, on obesity and and overweight. I mean, you mentioned statins there. I mean, first and foremost, remind people who, who perhaps have been lucky enough not to ever have to take them or know anyone who's Eight ever had to take them. do. Well, that's the, <laughs> yeah. So there's plenty of them out yeah. there. Remind us what they are. But that was the drug that came to mind, something where you essentially are medicating an entire cohort of the population. Yeah, the, the, these drugs tackle cholesterol, mm. high cholesterol. And if you've given uh, statins, it, 
it dramatically reduces your your risk of heart disease by about a quarter, something mm. like that. I mean, it, it is such a big deal. And these drugs have been around for decades, 80s, 90s, uh, in, in some cases, that they are generic medications. Mm. They're not patented anymore, so they are cheap as chips. Now, that's not the case with uh, semiglutides. These drugs are still heavily protected legally. Uh, they Someone's are, making an awful lot of money. They are there. owned by no- Nova Nordisk, mm-hmm. um, uh, the, the Danish pharmaceutical firm. Though, though they are, there is a, a slightly different group of drugs which are now being developed by Eli Lilly, the American mm-hmm. company. So there is now some competition between those, those drug companies. But it is a long time before those go generic, a long time before the NHS can access cheap drugs. Back to you later, Thomas. So how on earth does this apparent wonder drug actually work? And just how safe is it? Dr Simon Cork is a senior lecturer in physiology from Anglia Ruskin University. Uh, Dr Cork, how well do we understand the efficacy of semaglutide? We've known um, from previous studies that people who take semaglutide who are overweight have a decrease in things like blood pressure, a decrease in their blood glucose levels and their cholesterol, all of which would translate to uh, improvements in, in cardiovascular health. But we have always assumed that that is a consequence of these patients losing weight. Now, what the study that's released today has shown is that even in patients who didn't lose very much weight, they still showed improvements in cardiovascular health. And so there seems to be an independent pathway through which these drugs are are able to modify cardiovascular health in a beneficial way. Mm. To the layman, it almost seems somewhat counterintuitive. A drug developed originally uh, for treating diabetes, we then discover that it has an effect on patients in terms of their weight, tackles obesity, and now we find out that it also has an effect on potentially on coronary conditions. Previously, we had assumed that, that the improvements in cardiovascular health were as a consequence of losing weight. And we know in patients who lose weight through other means, they also have improvements in cardiovascular health. The difference with this study is that those improvements in cardiovascular health were independent of how much body weight they've lost. Now, these drugs were developed through years and years, if not decades, of basic scientific research, understanding the biology and the physiology of how this system that that these drugs work with, how that works. And that's what's led us to develop these drugs for use in diabetes and and obesity. We know from preclinical studies, so studies using animal models, that, that this system is also expressed in in the cardiovascular system. So in the heart, there are receptors for the the system that this drug works on. But we have not previously uh, identified, certainly in humans, that the beneficial effects of targeting the system on the cardiovascular system is independent of body weight. And I think that's the big finding from this study today. And in addition, there are plenty of people who are getting excited about the prospect of using semaglutides on conditions that we haven't even mentioned yet, running the gamut from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's. Yeah, and again, uh, preclinical evidence of Alzheimer's disease, for example, have shown that these drugs do have some protective effects on neurons and maybe uh, may have some beneficial effects in Alzheimer's disease. That hasn't yet manifested into clinical trials. But one of the things that is important from, from these studies that are being conducted on patients who are overweight is that it's demonstrating long-term safety of these drugs as well. So if we do find other conditions for which these drugs are uh, show improvements, we know that largely the drugs are safe to be taken long-term. Which leads me directly to the question, whenever we have a, a drug such as this, which people are suggesting should be rolled out on a very large-scale basis, whether there are side effects that people need to be mindful of or perhaps need to be concerned about. So most of the people who take these drugs will experience what we would consider to be mild gastrointestinal side effects. So things like nausea and vomiting and and constipation, which can be very upsetting and and not very nice for those who are are taking them. And for some people, they will be too severe to, to continue on the drugs. For the vast majority of people, those are transient. For some patients, a very small number of patients, there are some serious potential side effects of gallstones, and then there are some potential effects on the pancreas as well. What I will say is that the really important thing is that anyone who's considering taking these drugs or or interested in them does so with medical supervision. Doctor, how often does this happen, that a drug developed for a single purpose 
turns out to have utility in so many other areas. It does happen. There are lots of drugs that are being looked at for other conditions. I think really what the success of this drug points to is the importance of basic scientific research. We know so much about how this drug works because for decades, scientists have been working in labs to understand the pathways and the biology behind the system that these drugs work on. So we know already a lot about the underlying physiology and where the system that's called is the GLP-1 is, is how these drugs work, how GLP-1 works within the body, because we've done lots and lots and lots of basic physiological research that's now being able to translate into the bedside. So finally, Dr. Cork, just tell me, how much of a breakthrough is this, really? So I think the reason why this drug is getting so much airtime and so much media attention is really because we've not had anything as effective for treating obesity as this. Now, if you look at, at the drugs that have come down the pipeline previously, there's been plenty of drugs used to treat obesity, but lots of them have ultimately turned out to be unsafe. They cause heart damage, they cause psychological disorders, and so are subsequently taken off. The reason why this drug is getting so hyped up is because it is really effective and so far seems to be really safe, as well as having beneficial effects on other systems. Dr. Simon Cork, great to have you on the podcast. Thanks very much for joining us. When we come back, we'll be looking at a couple of other key factors, cost and availability. Stay there. Welcome back. So far, so good. Semaglutide works well, the side effects are known and apparently manageable, but to roll it out on the scale anticipated by the study's authors would be a financial burden indeed. Our science and medical correspondent Thomas Moore is back again. Let, let, let's deal with that topic which we've been kind of skirting around cost. And it's, it's not just cost, it's scarcity as well. Because if we're talking about rolling this out on the scale that the authors of the study would like us to be considering. We need access to this drug in huge quantities. And currently, even without this demand, there are shortages. There are people with type 2 diabetes who cannot get hold of this because I'm going to put myself out on a limb here and suggest that there are rich people able to get private consultations with GPs who are asking for this for weight loss purposes. Yes, I mean, that, that was certainly the issue to begin with, that mm -hmm. people living with diabetes were not able to get this life-changing medication. And of course, they should be getting the priority. Of course. Uh, and I don't think anybody would, would question that. Uh, that is supposed to be being resolved as supply is being ramped up. There are an awful lot of people who are, who are living with overweight and obesity mm -hmm. who are struggling to get treatment on the NHS mm -hmm. if they don't have diabetes. Uh, and I think that is a problem that the NHS is really going to have to get, get around. This is a worldwide issue. Mm. Everybody wants this drug. Everybody wants the, the competitor drug from, from Eli Lilly. As more drug companies come on stream, start ramping up production, these things should get less. But it is a fundamental problem at the moment. Mm. We have to assume that, you know, given the amount of money that will be filling this company's coffers, you know, they would be able to ramp up production to the levels that, that we are needing. But again, it's whether or not the NHS can afford it. We know how much, you know, heart disease costs the economy. We mentioned it already, £25 billion. That would be money that would be better spent elsewhere, particularly within the health service. I mean, do you get any indication that government is, is willing to scale up on this to reduce costs in a few years' time. So this is all to do with the National Institute for Clinical Health and Excellence, NICE. Yeah. Uh, they are the, the gatekeepers uh, in terms of the cost-effectiveness of, of medication within the NHS. They are the ones that write the rules. And they concluded that these drugs should be used but with big restrictions. Mm. And, and the, the availability of the drugs at the moment are, are on a trial basis. That's the, what the Department of Health has said, two-year trial. I think there is going to be now a fundamental... Uh, look again at the use of these drugs, not just because of the results we're hearing today, but already we we're hearing from number 10, the concern about loss of productivity in people who are uh, living with excess body weight. Everybody wants to get people back to work. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and if these drugs can do it, uh, and at the same time, improve their health and reduce the cost of the NHS, it's a win-win-win. Of course it is. Um, but I will wager the majority of people listening to this podcast who have heard of Azempic have heard of it in relation to weight loss. It's yeah. something that everyone has leapt on. But, but just in, in general terms, have we kind of as a society given up 
on reducing calorific intake and taking exercise as the means by which people lose weight. I mean, no one is suggesting that everyone who is taking a Zempic for weight loss purposes couldn't simply get on a treadmill and eat less to lose the weight that they lost through this drug, are they? Yeah, I think they are actually, Neil. Go on. Because I think the more we understand about obesity, mm -hmm. um, the more we understand that it's not as simple as getting on a treadmill and looking at your diet. You know, to, For some to, people it is. It, it is extremely mm -hmm. difficult. It has a pernicious effect on people's mental health. Mm -hmm. It changes the way they think. We live in an environment where calories are easily accessed and they are cheap. And that switches on neural pathways, which we haven't had active in our brains for millennia. Mm. Uh, and now they are switched on. And people have this craving to consume calories. And they're often rubbish calories. And that mm. is a fundamental problem in the way we live in uh, at the moment. We live with industrial food. And in that kind of environment, we probably do need some kind of medical help. But in that kind of environment, isn't the thing we should be targeting, the you know, over-processed food, rather than prescribing a drug which allows us to take the over-processed yeah. uh, cal calories into our body and then lose them quite simply? Look, are we medicalizing obesity yeah, is, is really the question. Yeah. And yes, we are, undoubtedly, mm. just to get through this phenomenal effect on people's health and, and the NHS. There is no doubt that this is a fix. Mm. Um, and But how many times, how many reports have we seen coming out from government and elsewhere mm. that we're going to encourage people to walk more or eat less or the five a day? Yeah. It is hard to change people's behaviours when they live in this barrage of advertising, of easy access to food, where biscuits are on the end, end of the aisle, we all of these up, we things. We came out of a COVID pandemic in which, you know, pretty much all of us were for a certain period of time pretty sedentary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And those behaviours have, have been in, ingrained. So people are exercising less, they're eating less well. Um, so these are across populations having a massive effect. Thomas Moore, great to have you in the podcast. Heart disease places a huge burden on the health service, so much so that it compels a long, hard look at mass prescription of semaglutide. Its effects on obesity are similarly remarkable, not to forget its role in tackling diabetes. And that it may also be useful in treating conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is the glacé cherry on the sugar-free icing on the cake. But wouldn't it be better if people didn't develop heart problems in the first place? That's your lot for this edition of The Daily. We'll see you again soon.